Good evening and welcome to Greater Somerville for March 7th, 2017. I'm Joe Lynch. The Somerville Community Corporation has been a fixture in Somerville's civic, political, and economic life for over 45 years. With a mission of empowering residents to sustain a diverse and affordable Somerville. With jobs, housing, sensible development, and social equity at the top of their agenda, the organization has been led for the last 16 years by its executive, the chief executive officer, Danny LeBlanc. It is my pleasure to welcome him back to the new Somerville Media Center and Somerville, Greater Somerville. Welcome back, Danny. Thanks, Joe. How's that? I don't have a teleprompter. I, you know, my eyes are going. I got to read this stuff. <laughs> Old guys, what are we going to do? Old right? guys, you know, you just got to keep plugging along. Right. Welcome back hey. to Sket TV. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so here. we had a little bit of a name change where we've got three major entities now down here. We have the original yep. Somerville Community Access Television. Mm -hmm. We have Boston Free Radio. Uh -huh. And we now have Somerville Neighborhood News. That's great. So we are now a full-fledged media center. Which is a good thing. And good you've been around long enough to know when we were just a little fledgling TV yeah. station. Yeah, I've been around long enough to remember the really early days of SCAT TV, actually. I moved so, here in the 70s. So. Speaking, speaking of how long both of us have been operating here, <laughs> I want to make sure that people know um, we're going to be broadcasting tonight at 730. But I want to make sure they know about your annual meeting and dinner. Right. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, March 8th, March 8th. Wednesday, um, at the uh, Arts at the Armory on uh, Highland Avenue. It'll be our 47th annual uh, meeting and dinner, wow. uh, you know, to kind of underscore how long we've been around as an organization. Uh, welcome anybody in the community. We, we do have a registration list, but you, people should come if they've registered or not. Uh, it, you know, dinner. Uh, program a lot of socializing, some music and stuff. It's a fun, fun affair. So we would in welcome anybody to join. Terrific! Us tomorrow right night. up at Arts at the Armory on Highland Avenue, directly across the street from uh, the Jean Jugan residence. Yes, little, exactly. Yeah, old timers will call it the Little Sisters of the Poor, <laughs> right. but right. Si sister who runs the place says Jean Jugan. Okay. <laughs> so that's terrific, Danny. You know, for the folks at home, you know, we do have we are in an enormous change period mm -hmm. here in Somerville. Right. People hear about SCC, mm -hmm. Somerville Community Corporation, all the time. Yep. You guys are building, you guys have a mission. Tell, you know, for those newer folks in the city, tell them a little bit about SCC. Yeah, so we're, uh, you know, we would be called a community development corporation. There's about 60 or 70 CDCs across the state of Massachusetts. Um, and each uh, CDC has a kind of a mission that is really, um, uh, specific to its community, but it's generally around uh, building and enhancing that community economically. Generally, uh, is what we what we go for, and you know, quality of life issues as well. So, in a place like Somerville, as as you said, Joe, the um, especially over the last, you know, depending on how you want to count, 10, 15, 20, 25 sure. years, yep. affordability has become uh, the biggest picture issue that, that faces us. And the, the question of whether the cost of housing is going to cause Somerville to not continue to be the kind of diverse community that we've all come to love. Um, so as, in terms of the work that we do and the mission we try to carry out here, it's about building and preserving affordable housing, some of it new, some of it existing housing. Um, Increasingly, we've been focusing on the sort of the financial health of households and often for most households that goes to jobs and the earned income that people can earn. And then we, we, uh, we use this term social equity or equity uh, for short. And essentially what we mean by that is that we want an equitable result of all of these from all of these market forces that have really, there's a lot of blessings as we know that sure. come along with that. But we also want the, the fruits of those blessings to be distributed equitably, basically. So we look at you know, things like, how much does it cost to live in Somerville these days? Right. And the mission of SEC, you, know, you guys have been around for a long, long time, but it appears as though here now in 2017, yeah. housing is so important to the mission that you guys have, right? If if you do, it's almost just logical. If you if you assume as as we do that our mission is about protecting a healthy, economically diverse community, you can't have that if people can't afford to live here in the first place. So right. so you right. you have to have housing affordable at different price points for people. So 
Um, you know, the market pretty much will take care of itself, but as we know, the market has been driving up and up. And so you get these gaps starting at, at quite low incomes, but really running up into moderate and middle incomes today, where we've got to find ways to stabilize some housing at the price points that those households can afford. Otherwise, we're not going to have the kind of diverse community that we want. So. Well, you know, and I know, I mean, it was far-fetched for any of us to have predicted that there would be million-dollar-plus condos right. just flooding the market. Yeah. And that's not hyperbole. That is a case of where we, as a community, have been successful. Yes. We've been successful in attracting development to yeah. our city, which, I, you know, I don't think there's anybody who disagrees with it. You need to have development in order to stay a healthy community. Yeah. But there's the downside of that. Yeah. And the downside is, and I use the term, some people don't like that I use it, but <laughs> I, went, I lived in Boston for many years, and mm -hmm. that was the term we used, is gentrification. Yeah. And gentrification, in my, <clears throat> my opinion, Danny, just basically means is that there are people who are not, their incomes are not keeping pace with the cost of living in a certain community. Mm -hmm. And that could be jobs, that could be housing, that could be their, a lot of retirees, yeah. no longer at their peak earning capacity. Yeah. So they get yeah. priced out. Right, right. right. And, and we, you know, generally we often, the other term we use, which is a loaded term that people, some people like, some people don't like, is displacement. Mm -hmm. right? is, are, are those people that you're speaking about being displaced by higher earning people who mm -hmm. can afford to pay a higher cost for the housing. Um, part of the problem is that those terms are loaded and they often get personalized. And right. I've never felt this is personal. People, everybody should have a right to live where they choose to live, but that also includes low and moderate income people. Those are the ones that generally get left out of the choices to live in a place like Somerville. I, I've often told younger people here you know, when I moved here in the 70s, the only people who lived in Somerville were the ones who couldn't afford to get out. Correct. And now those right. very same people can't afford to stay or they're, you know, they they're can't afford to get back. They either. can't afford to get back or right. they can't afford to remain here. It's not the same people, literally, because they're descendants and newer immigrants and so forth. But the same income levels of people right. who were the only ones who could afford who who. Somerville was the only kind of place they could afford 40 years ago. Now they can't afford to be here even if they want to. So that's the dynamic we really have to wrestle with. And I know your organization also concentrates heavily on job opportunities. Yes. Because it's not just a case of where the, one of your missions is the affordability of housing that's being built or housing that's churning. Yeah. Is you can make all the affordable housing you want, but if people don't have that job, economic, right. that job opportunity, yeah. Let's go, I mean, I, I've always admired SEC because you do put your money where your mouth is. Um, you just recently built down here in Union Square. Correct, yeah. And how many units of affordable, affordable uh, housing? 35 units of affordable housing uh, uh, above some retail space on the ground floor, right. uh, you know, what will be very close to the uh, first new Green Line stop. Yep. Um, and one of the reasons why we were interested in that property when it became available. And that's not the only one. I, I, I don't mean, uh, it's the closest to us here in Union Square, sure, but you yeah. also pil uh, built uh, St. Polycarp's Village. Right. Uh, that's a total of 84 affordable apartments. And we, we had bought the entire campus back in 2006. And we were also pleased to be able to preserve the church. It's mm -hmm. still a place of worship with now a, uh, an evangelical Haitian congregation. Yep that owns that building. And we were also able to keep Just to Start House, which is a program for unwed uh, young mothers and their children, which had been renting at St. Polycarp's. We kept them on the campus and then built 84 new, new units of affordable housing there. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about what's gonna happen over the next you know, three, five, 10 years, yeah. where the development is at a breathtaking pace here mm -hmm. in the city. Yeah. We have places within the city, such as Assembly Square, right. Boynton Yards, Inner Belt, where the density of the building that's going up mm -hmm. really isn't having a direct displacement or gentrification on existing neighborhoods. Right. But that changes once you come into a neighborhood like Union Square. Yeah, it, or it can at least, and it's a, it's a tough battle. I think the close, the, the two things that happen when you're more 
when you're redeveloping in a, a in a Union Square, let's say, or in a Gilman Square, in to in a smaller scale Magoon where you mm -hmm. live, you know, Ball Square, Teal um, Square. Yeah, yeah, these are intact neighborhoods with a lot of density already of existing housing. So you have um, you have zoning and neighborhood impact concerns, which are just traditional, but you don't have those in Assembly Square. There, is, there wasn't a neighborhood when they started building there. Right. So just the impact on people's daily lives. When we built Washington Street, 181 Washington, we're very close to immediate abutters. So you have those usual issues. And then I think, the, I think there's mixed opinion about this, but I think it's logical to think that there may be a more immediate cost impact on the surrounding housing as well. Right. Now, from my perspective, honestly, I see the costs of, uh, of existing housing in Somerville rising at a pretty astronomical pace anyway, mm -hmm. even with or without new development. And our organization, in fact, in collaboration that, excuse with me, the Excuse me, Danny, that's being really driven by the Green Line. Well, I think it's being driven by the Green Line, but I also think it's just being driven by the overwhelming market trend. When you think about it for a minute. So it's our location to the capital city as well. That's right. Even without the Green Line, I think, uh, now the Green Line's gonna, certainly going to enhance that, and the prospect of the Green Line is already enhancing that. But I think we'd be seeing a lot of that dynamic if nobody ever heard of the Green Line, honestly, because of that proximity. Um, you because know, the, the jobs are located in the capital city. Right, Boston and Cambridge has right. a lot of jobs in Cambridge. Well, if you can't get housing in those two places, this is actually a very nice residential community to be in. And as I've told a lot of people over the years, I live in East Somerville, and I'm much closer to the financial district than some of my friends who live in West Roxbury sure. or Roslindale, which are city of Boston, but they're further out neighborhoods, you yep. know. So, <coughs> excuse me. Take a sip. Bit of a cold take a, here. Take a sip there. <coughs> I think I will do that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's an enormous uh, shift that's taking place all throughout the um, economic region of Massachusetts, yep. which is mainly centered in the eastern part of the part of the state, yep. in that you have people who are no longer um, willing to travel the one and a half hours from right. you know outside of 495 or outside of 128. Yep. Even you know one of my own brothers-in-law who's down in Hingham, as much as he loves taking the boat, yeah. you know from Hingham into Boston, going home. He doesn't like so much. Yeah, at night in the winter or in the, the winter. water and right, stuff like right. that. Yeah. No so you, what you have is almost like a migration. <laughs> you have a migration of people, and what appears to be happening here in the city is that you have a much higher income bracket yeah. that are coming into the city because of its location, because, and I joke with the mayor all the time, we're now a sexy commodity in we metropolitan are. Boston. Oh, absolutely. Everybody wants to be here. Yeah. The downside of that is that housing gets swallowed up right. and the less affluent get pushed out. Right. So your mission and your organization is to kind of act as almost like a stopgap for that in providing more affordable housing. Yeah. The reason I think is I, I wanted to have you on the show for the longest time is because it's been an issue for a while. Yeah. Not just to pump the annual meeting, which is coming up tomorrow night, but you know, it's been an issue that now seems to be a little bit of acrimony between certain groups about when the city redoes a entity called Union Square, yeah. where you have heavily residential surrounding the commercial district, what kind of community benefits should the city be pushing for mm -hmm. right. from the developers who are coming in? Affordable housing seems to be one thing that we can be pushing for front and center. Yeah, I, I, I agree, and, and of course, um, as an organization, we, we got behind and, and actually submitted to the Board of Aldermen last year a, um, an initiative uh, to change the zoning ordinance to increase the inclusionary housing requirement to 20%. To 20%, actually. Right. And I think- J you could, Just for the folks at home, inclusionary housing means when big developers come in, yes. you, they are required <laughs> to provide so many affordable housing right. units as part of their development. 20% of their units have to be affordable right. and there's, there is a definition of affordability. We went from 12.5% um, to 20. To the 20 right. citywide. I think you could make a case and it's worth at least considering in places like Union Square, whether in fact you may may go a little higher even than that, and I think that's at least on the table for mm -hmm. consideration and community benefits. I think the the two of the other things that I would say, I think there's a lot of issues of concern around 
a place like Union Square. And uh, understandably, it's a dense community. So some of the interest is around, well, can you and how much can you create some open space opportunities for sure. people who live here? That, that's a legitimate thing. Who's going to get the benefit of the jobs that may locate here in, in office buildings or commercial spaces that get built, that kind of stuff. Traffic or, mitigation. Traffic mitigation, yeah. parking concerns. You know, we're, it's still, we're still a very dense city, so as much as we've become more of a city of walkers and bikers and so forth, we still have a lot of cars, obviously. Right. I drive one, you drive one, probably. Yep. Um, so uh, our thinking about Union Square in general is that when, when the city or, or the community is contemplating uh, what would be a major redevelopment, and I, and I think if you, if you want to think in terms of scale, I think what's being contemplated in Union Square is, is on the scale of new development that we're seeing at Assembly Square, except as you said, it's, it's in here and there within the existing Union Square fabric. Yep. And, Assembly Square pretty arguably didn't have a fabric. It had a, just a mall there. It was, it was an industrial like, area. Right, and yeah. much of it empty, actually. You know, there was Central Steel was still operating at the time, but a lot of it was empty when, when the new development started. So when you're going to do that uh, in general, uh, but especially in an intact community, it makes sense to simply ask the question around nego negotiating for a range of benefits that will accrue to the community. And then as, as, a, as a community, along with the city government and along with the developer, you negotiate those things out to say what, there's gonna be some real good things that will come about as a result of this new development. What are the things we need as a community to get out of that at the same time? And so we've been, uh, you know, the Union United Coalition, which we're a member of, uh, and we provide some staff support too, has tried to raise that question basically, and yep. we've been doing that for a couple of years. And I would say, you know, I follow a lot of, it's not really my neighborhood, but I do follow what's going on down here. It's a and small city. Un <laughs> Union, yeah, it is a small city. <laughs> Union United is made up of multiple interest groups, right. multiple all over the place. I was, I was kind of surprised. I joke with um, Father Brian McHugh. He yep. was the pastor here, and Over I said, well, yeah. since when did you come, become an activist? And he said, oh, no, no, it's always been my mission. Yeah, right. right. It right. just takes a different form when it comes to, it's his neighborhood. Yes. St. Joe's Church. So. No, that's right. And uh, Father Richard, who, who's yeah. uh, on staff with Father McHugh, is, has been very active in the coalition's efforts. How many so. total units? I just kind of want to make it a little easier yeah. for, our, um, for our folks at home. How many total units of affordable housing have we got in the city now? We've got, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use round numbers because sure. um, it's, it's a moving target a little bit, but we've got about 3,500 units of dedicated affordable housing. Um, it's not enough, though, is it? No, it's a, it, it, you know, again, in round numbers, it's about 3,500 out of about 35,000, so about 10%. Yep. And one of the questions we've been raising uh, in, in recent years, and we've been collaborating with the city on this, is that things like inclusionary housing are great. What that does is get you a percentage of the new housing that gets built. Mm -hmm. Well, if you just do the math that I just pointed out, 35,000 total minus 3,500 affordable, you've got 31,500 that are just privately owned housing, right. not restricted. In the old days, they, they used to call this naturally occurring affordable housing. Mm -hmm. You and I remember the rents were just cheap. Yep. Yep. It's not true anymore, and there's no protection to keep those things affordable. So we're trying to collaborate with the city on a way to capture some of those units. And of course, that could be among the community benefits that could derive from new development in Union Square. Could there be efforts? Houses are going to be bought and sold. That right, happens every right. day. Could some of the existing housing that's going to be sold anyway be acquired and protected as long-term affordable. And would that be the city doing it on their own or in partnership with you or well, you you guys? Because you have we, been yeah, doing that. Yeah, the city that. generally is not in the business of buying property, but right. we, we've got a, um, a, um, an arrangement with the city. We've, we've got a contract and an agreement. So we, we call it, the city gave it this label, 100 Homes Program. Mm -hmm. We've been purchasing some two and three family homes. We're just out there on the market like any other buyer, basically. But when we are able to buy, strike a deal, we have an agreement with the city that the city will use some of its Community Preservation Act mm -hmm. funds to subsidize the cost of purchasing that 
so that our cost comes down to the point where we can rent at a certain level and our commitment on the other hand will be to keep that permanently affordable at that level. Mm -hmm. So it's, these are not generally low income and you know I will tell you honestly the rents tend to go 1500 to 2000 for sure. these apartments. Oh, yeah. But in a, at a time when the average rent of a two bedroom is 2500 if you can get it down that level to that level and you have a permanent commitment to keep it at that level then you're meeting an affordability that's that's needed yeah. and, and is otherwise lost i would tell you Danny, i mean you know as i age <laughs> slightly you know i i have friends run the gamut in the economic spectrum yeah. and there isn't a month that goes by mm -hmm. where I don't see, you know, somebody probably a little bit older than I am. They're probably in their 70s and they're, yeah. they're, they're no longer peak earning capacity. They may have never had the opportunity to purchase <clears throat> and they're looking for public housing. Yeah. Do we have enough? Now, a public housing should not be confused with affordable housing. Right. Public housing, meaning some of the city run entities or the federal yep. project systems. Yep. Do we have enough of those? I, you know, I would say probably not. And when I, the figures that I quoted before, the 3,500 units, that includes public housing. It does and include I, that. I, I would argue that that's one of the most critical resources we have because it's nearly half of that 3,500 is public housing. Um, two big family developments, as we know, Clarendon and Mystic, yep. and then a, a bunch of elderly disabled developments. There's probably a tenor of those, and yep. are, those are all Place, Places such as Highland Gardens and, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Cape, it's Cape, uh, Cape and Court. Cape and Court. Cape yeah. and Court. Uh, yeah. There's a, you know, like I said, there's maybe 10 or 12 of them scattered throughout the city. Those are all managed by the Somerville Housing Authority, right. and they would, uh, strictly speaking, be considered public housing. Part of the problem is the federal government got out of the business of building public right. housing a long time ago. Right. So much as I believe we could use more of it, I don't think we're going to see any more of it. So we need to find other ways to build affordable housing that will not, the kind of stuff that we do, the principal term that gets used is low income housing tax credits. That's, that's the federal government's contribution to the development of new affordable rental housing right. today. And an organization like yours qualifies for that. We do, and, and the Somerville Housing dollars. Authority has actually right. built a couple themselves. Um, Cape and Court was rebuilt that way when they redeveloped Cape and Court um, about five years ago, something yeah. like that. So. You have a lot on your plate, my friend. Let's talk about, you know, quickly some of the stuff that's coming up for you in the not too distant future. Yeah, well, I, you know, I mentioned this 100 Homes program. We're excited about it because we're, we've been able to acquire about 20 units of existing housing, you know, already. So that's, that's a great thing. Um, we are, as you mentioned, we're involved in the Union United Coalition that is working with the city and with the developer to try to, you know, essentially get a, t a table, quote unquote, mm -hmm. where, uh, on which you can really negotiate a community benefits agreement that everybody's happy with. And, you know, negotiations are, are what they are. I've been I, through I, them. I, I, I know it, what they I are. Think <laughs> if anybody's fully happy, right, you haven't had a negotiation. That's right. So That's right. Everybody gets something, nobody gets everything. That would be ideal. But some things that really would be useful to the effort of sustaining Somerville as, as a diverse community while it gets redeveloped. Um, we're involved in a partnership that we're very excited about with the. Um, Somerville Housing Authority, Preservation of Affordable Housing, which is a larger nonprofit owner, regional nonprofit owner of affordable housing, and Gate Residential, a private developer mm -hmm. that, among other things, um, developed Maxwell's Green. Yes. Um, Kyle, so, is Kyle still uh, associated? Kyle is. He's not the, 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 the guy that we're mostly working with there is Greg Bialecki, who yep. uh, used okay. to be the Secretary of um, Housing and Economic housing. Development in the Patrick right. administration when he left state government. He's now working for Gate Residential. And um, that partnership is seeking to redevelop the Clarendon public housing so that the public housing gets completely rebuilt, brand new housing, mm -hmm. but there will be added to that 250 or so uh, market rate units and 40 or 50 what some people call workforce or middle income but mm -hmm. restricted affordable housing. So it's the, that would be added to the affordable housing stock as and well. And that seems to be the model that a lot of the <clears throat> public housing units yeah. are going through. Instead of, you know, it's I come from old Somerville. So yeah. when somebody said they lived in the projects so or right. they lived in public housing, sure. you would typically think of very low income. But yeah. what they're trying to do now is 
don't make that distinction. Yeah. You know, you know let's meld everybody well, in together. Let's try to create a mixed income campus. Right. That's what the, this right. redesign is uh, aiming to do. The other thing is, just to be honest about it, the neither this is state public housing at Clarendon. Correct. Um, we have federal and state, but in both. Federal uh, is Faulkner, isn't it Faulkner? No, Faulkner is Faulkner's actually, believe it or not, a different form of affordable housing. There was an error between public housing and the low income housing tax credits that I mentioned, okay. Okay. where um, they were giving mortgage guarantees and rent subsidies to private developers in exchange for affordability commitments. Got it. So Faulkner got developed it. that way. Um, it's privately owned, but it's got restrictions for affordability. But the, neither the state nor federal government are, are actually providing enough money to really operate and recapitalize these buildings. So Clarendon's a good example. It was built in the late 40s. It's about 70 years old, and it's tired at this point. And that, that hence the need for somebody like a Somerville Community Corporation yeah. to come and, in and fill the void. And our partners, so the, the market rate development is actually contributing substantial amount of money to the redevelopment of the public housing. The state is is cultivating this kind of arrangement and it's it part of recognition on the state's part that they're not able to provide enough money. So, so one of the one of the ways that you know the average Joe here mm -hmm. average Joe here yeah. in Somerville can support the Somerville Community Corporation is by attending their annual meeting and yes. uh, dinner dance. Dinner, yeah, oh yeah, yeah dinner there's dance. always a little bit of dancing at the end. Yeah, but there, well, I know you do. <laughs> Up at the uh, Somerville Arts for the Armory on Highland Avenue tomorrow night, of March 8th. Correct. Starting at? Uh, doors will open at 5, um, and dinner's probably about 6 o'clock. Terrific. Uh, I hope social time and so forth. I hope to see you there, Danny. I hope you can make it. Thank you so much for coming into Greater Somerville. Best wishes. Great. On all future endeavors. Thank you, and thanks for having me, Joe. Thanks, Danny. My guest has been Danny LeBlanc, the CEO of the Somerville Community Corporation, SCC. As always, thanks for joining us. Stay safe, stay informed. See you next time. Mm -hmm.